Hi everyone, Simon from Horma Studio. Today we're going to have a look at how to reshape the lighting of an image by using three simple tools, the level of or curve adjustment layer, uh, the dodge tool and the burn tool. So let's get started. Um, so as a base image, there's one thing that I think I should mention first is that I tend to try to get a really low contrast image. To do so, what I do is that in the rendering panel or the VFB, I usually by default, you're going to have the highlight burn set to one. Here, it's like the difference is not really big because I've actually imported the JPEG back, but whatever. But what I do is usually put this back at like 0.5, which means the render is going to look slightly flat, but it's actually something you want to have in your image afterward. What you do then is to save it in at least 16-bit or even 32 if you can, but I usually work in 16-bit and TIFF um, file. Then we are in here. I want to get rid of this. Uh, so what I do first is I'm going to show you how to basically set up the thing and the layers so that you don't um, basically change too much the image and work in a, what we call like non-destructive way. So to do so, the first thing you're going to do, I'm going to delete those. Um, instead of like changing the level by going into the panel and doing like that kind of thing and where then you can't really change anything anymore, what you're going to do is you're going to go into the adjustment panel here and go into the curves or levels depending on the ones you like. And so here we're going to have something that can be changed uh, in a more uh, flexible way. The other thing that you want to do is that instead of using the burn tool and then completely fuck up your image and not be able to get it back, what you want to do is to actually create a blank layer, uh, fill it with um, the 50% gray and set this to overlay. And what it's going to do is that it's going to let you use the burn tool or the dodge tool while actually not uh, keeping it on a separate layer. So what I usually now do is that I have um, a burn and dodge um, action here that I use really often. Uh, and that uh, is really the base of like the changes in the image. Another thing that I use a lot is that uh, you need to actually set your image in black and white before working. The reason for this is pretty simple is that um, the composition is going to be mainly uh, like the feeling or like the perception of your image is going to be based on value and to change the values it's actually better or easier to do it in black and white. So to set your image in black and white there's it can sound stupid but there's like two different ways to do it. One is actually the bad way and the other one is the good way or at least according to me. What sometimes people do is to just like use a use saturation um, adjustment layer and just change the saturation and put it to zero. The thing is, the issue is that if you're changing your colors, for instance, uh, if I'm changing something here, uh, so it's like, so that you see the difference here, for instance, I'm like doing this. So this looks really different, but if I'm using a U saturation set with the saturation set to zero, I don't even see what's going on, which means that later on, if I'm changing my hues and saturation of my image, I'm actually not uh, recording the differences in values. So what you want to do is instead of using that version, you're going to use a channel mixer, which is accessible here as well. And what you do is you use the channel mixer and you just set it to monochrome and you you can let the default uh, thing. And the changes you'll see is that if I do like change the, um, the saturation here, whoops, sorry, not you, you. If I do change the hue or the saturation, you can see that the channel mixer records it. And that way it means that I can actually see that the um, that uh, the values are changed as well. Whereas if I was using the U saturation one, 
as I said earlier, nothing is changing. So that's something to keep in mind when you're actually starting to work in black and white because some people uh, usually go with the use saturation and kind of miss uh, an opportunity to have something a little bit more uh, advanced. Now that we have all this, what do we basically do? Because it's nice to know like the technical aspect of the image of the software, like I need to work in a non-destructive way, but what do I really do with those um, tools in order to basically make my image better? In terms of composition and lighting, there are several important uh, concepts to know that are mostly related to the Gestalt theory and uh, other stuff. But uh, the main one we're gonna uh, deal with today or focus on is the concept of greatest area of contrast. The greatest area of contrast is basically this idea that our eyes are gonna be attracted to the, well, as the name suggests, the area where the contrast is the greatest. So uh, for instance, if we have a white background and a black shape, our eyes are going to be attracted to, the, to that black shape. And it works the other way around as well. If we have a black background and a white shape, our eyes are going to be attracted to that white shape. In more complex images, uh, our primitive eyes are going to be perceiving the image as like a collection of shapes rather than actual identifiable objects, which means that it's going to perceive the image as a sort of like black and white um, blurry images, uh, which is why, for instance, it's important or interesting when you uh, look at an image in terms of composition to sort of blur the image and what you can do and what it's going to do basically is that once it has this sort of like perceived uh, image of your image basically it's gonna your eye is gonna be are gonna be attracted to the areas where the contrast is the greatest so even if you have like different shades of gray everywhere your eyes are still gonna be attracted to like the widest spot that is uh, surrounded by the darkest area or the other way around, depending on like the overall values that you have in your image. So what it means when we look at this image is that we're gonna have, or we're gonna try to, like the way it's gonna work is that you're gonna have this considered as a black thing, meaning that the contrast is gonna be increased in this area, meaning that our eyes are gonna be drawn to this or Rather, we're going to try to enhance the image so that our eyes are drawn to the part of the image that we want. We're going to see actually that, uh, but maybe you've noticed it already, that the greatest area of contrast in this image is actually not a building, but it's this car here, which is why you need to be careful with like all the elements you add, because sometimes you can draw attention unintentionally to uh, completely secondary or even... Uh, worse than secondary, a completely trivial uh, object in your image. One way to judge the uh, greatest area of contrast is to use a thing called, an adjustment layer called threshold, which is as usual available here. And where is it? Threshold. And what threshold does is that it basically clamps um, in black and white, uh, the basically the value. So basically, for instance, if I go here, Everything that is, uh, or sorry, how can I explain that? Basically it chooses a value. Everything that is above that value is white. Everything that is under that value is black. And what it lets you do is to check what's the brightest point of your image. So as you can see, and as I was saying earlier, the brightest point of my image is not really the, um, the building, but it's the car here, which is not really what we want. So this is why I would actually probably, this was a work in progress, so the car probably just disappeared or was blurred or was in another um, color altogether. So this little tool is actually interesting in letting you basically double check that the, what should be dark is dark and what should be bright is bright. Keep in mind also that the sky is like um, psychologically perceived as something let's say normal. So even if you have a super bright sky and it stays in your threshold quite a long time, it doesn't mean that it's going to become your greatest area of contrast because we are, are like wired to then switch to something more interesting. And in terms of like density as well, because if this is like a sky with not much in it, then we're going to be interested with stuff that are like more dense in terms of information. So no, on to the nitty-gritty part that is going to be quite quick but uh that's the whole point actually so where's my i think i okay so i'm going to recreate it so as i said 
uh, you create channel mixer, go monochrome. And here we have our thing and we're working in black and white. The first thing I do usually is just to start with a curve adjustment by just popping up the um, highlight and lowering a little the, um, the dark part basically. Here it's a little bit too much, but it doesn't really matter. I tend to, like one thing to keep in mind is that, and this is the whole point of non-destructive thing, is that you can do like a first pass and then just group everything and uh, lower the opacity. So you're gonna see how it works. But here, for instance, you can see already the difference between what we had before and what we had now, where everything on the left, for instance, here is becoming completely like so dark that it's quite irrelevant to our eyes so that we're focusing again more on this part or this part. So what we do next is to use the dodge tool usually. So this guy here, and you start to highlight areas that you want to basically your eye to be drawn to. There's a couple of things to understand with the dodge tool. Uh, just one thing before, uh, I usually set it always on highlights and the exposure is super low, like 9% or 10%, never above that. A couple of things that is interesting with the dodge tool is that it works especially well on like dense uh, textures. So usually like for the vegetation, it's gonna have like a really interesting effect to sort of like activate your foliage or on the textures like asphalt and stuff like that. So what you want is to actually just like highlight part of your image that you think are interesting and that it should be seen basically. And once you're done with it, you can like sort of uh, readjust the intensity. For instance, here we had like a pretty nice, um, what's the word? Like louver system with the wooden parts and stuff like that. And as I said earlier, the thing you can do is to then play with the, the opacity of your newly created layer. Also, the other thing that you can do is to always separate them. Like if you're starting to think that you're like past, whoops, sorry, if I just put it like that, that your thing is starting to be like a little bit too uh, crammed with like information, you can just recreate another one and go like this and use the dodge tool here and continue on like another topic. Then once you're done with it, you can start to sort of like balance the thing by, for instance, here we have like bright areas that are not really interesting. So what you can do is to start to burn them a little so that they don't pop out that much. It goes the same with like the burn tool and the dodge tool have this similar effect in the sense that they work really well on uh, actual textures with like details rather than um, than let's say like plain uh, things like that. Here you can see if I do that on the white surface here, there's nothing really much interesting happening. But if I do it on the, the asphalt here or on the sidewalk here, it's way more interesting. So that's pretty fun. Uh, one thing here that I would usually use quite a lot as well is to use the dodge tool on the sky to sort of like create a little bit of a contrast in between second several um, objects, for instance. One thing you can do as well, like that could be fun is to create like God rays, uh, like uh, paint them that way. But uh, this is a, a way to do it that would work. So then, as I said, you can group all this and change the opacity until you're happy with the result. And as you can see, this is like all our illumination or lighting uh, thing. And this is where we went from, and this is where we are now. So as you can see, in terms of perception, there's something quite different. Like here, we have something that is quite homogenous. So we have this part that is quite visible because it's the brightest one. And then we have like not really anything going, going on, basically. Whereas if we go with this one, we start to re-emphasize um, this part of the basically facade, we especially this one actually. Uh, sorry, I'm really doing like to this part is like being activated quite a lot with this, and this one is a little bit recessed, but still it's brighter, so you can still see it. So this is an interesting thing. One thing to keep in mind though, with the greatest area of contrast, is that um, it's not. Uh, it's not because you have more contrast that suddenly your image becomes better. What I meant by like the fact that you want to use that theory is that the, how can I say? 
it has like a sort of dynamism in the image, which is a good thing, but it can also be not what you're looking for. Meaning that if you have an image with a really low contrast, it doesn't mean that it's going to be boring or that you need to suddenly increase the contrast to have something happening. It just means that the way you're going to look at the image is going to be quite different. So if you have like a high contrast image, it means that you're going to have your eyes drawn to a certain um, area of the image. So ideally, this is the point of focus of your image. Meaning, uh, if you're doing something about a building, you don't want your point of focus to be like someone uh, not being near the building or something like that. But if it's a low contrast image, it just means that you're going to scan the image and it's going to have like a more uh, like calm way or calm feeling, basically, which could completely work if you have like a foggy image with like the sea or whatever. I mean, like something where you actually need some the the viewer to not feel compelled to look at something specific. So uh, I don't think I can add anything else uh, to the topic beside what I said already. Um, yeah, one thing I'm going to mention before I forget is that the two actions, so I use like a lot of actions because I'm, uh, I like automating things, especially things that I use all the time. So those check filters that I've been using with the um, threshold, etc., and the channel mixer, I'm going to put them uh, in the description so that you can download them for free um, on my Gumroad page. And it's the same with the burn and dodge tool. If you like the, the action will be packed with it as well so that you can use it and save time. So that will be it for this video. I hope you've learned some interesting stuff. Uh, I think it's really important to have like every time you use a tool to actually understand the theory behind it so that you use the tool the right way and know what to do with it rather than just have the technical knowledge of like, I know how to use the curve adjustment and uh, work in a non-destructive way. So hopefully this video will help you in that uh, focus in that area. And I'll see you in the next uh, video. Cheers, guys. Bye.